Hmm. Maybe it's time that I go back to iOS. Hmm. But then again, you did leave it because you were getting bored of iOS. But some of these new features that iPhones have just look too good to miss. But I also don't really fancy shelling out a thousand pounds to buy a phone I'm, I might not even like. Oh, I know. Mum's got an old 10s knocking around. Maybe I can borrow that. This, this is the iPhone XS, and I know what you're thinking. This, this isn't the new iPhone, and you would be right. This particular phone came out nearly five years ago in 2018. So why am I looking at this phone now in 2023? Well, there's a simple answer to that. Since 2017, I switched over from my trusty and reliable iPhone 6S and moved over to the land of green bubbles and picked up a Samsung Galaxy S8 and have been on Android ever since. However, the most recent iPhone launch for the iPhone 14 lineup really got me considering making the move back to iOS. My main issue is I haven't used iOS in nearly six years. That's a long time now. When I was last on iOS, I was still in university and switched mainly because I was bored of the software experience. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos, you might clock on that I'm not all about cashing out loads of money unnecessarily. Hell, I even made a video about fixing the charging port on my own phone rather than paying for someone else to fix it at a repair store. So, in a very me fashion, I've been borrowing and daily driving this iPhone XS for the last month or so. So I thought, well, why not hit two birds with one stone? How does the iPhone XS hold up in 2023? And how is iOS 16 faring from the viewpoint of someone who's been on Android for the last six years? So without any further introductions, let's get into this. The iPhone XS is arguably the forgotten younger brother of the era-defining iPhone X. Whilst riding on the coattails of its predecessor, it was certainly still a great phone in its own right. With it being just an incremental step up from the iPhone X, the XS hosts Apple's 7 nanometer with 6 core A12 Bionic CPU, 4 gigabytes of RAM, a 12 megapixel f1.8 camera, and up to 512 gigabytes of internal storage. This thing certainly wasn't messing around in terms of hardware performance back in 2018. But it's not 2018 anymore, it's 2023. And by today's standards, well, those specs aren't anything special. So it's probably not even worth worrying about them on paper. What we should be more interested in is after five years, is this still a usable phone? Short answer, yes. But with this phone now being discontinued from the Apple store and only being available on the refurbished or secondhand markets, a little bit more nuance needs to be considered. Somehow, after being warned the battery lives of iPhones severely suffer after years of heavy usage, well, this XS was just about good enough to get through a full workday. Meaning I only really needed to top it up full of juice when I got home before I was to charge it overnight anyway. Not ideal if you're going on long trips, but for day to day, it serves well. Now I bring this up first because, well, if the battery life was too much of an issue, then I would have easily given up testing this device for more than a couple of days. Something that I have always liked about iPhones is how well put together they are, and the XS is by no means an exception. Without a case, the XS feels incredibly premium in the hands. With your typical glass front and back panels and stainless steel side railings, you don't feel like you've been cheaped out when it comes to materials. The curved sides make the phone feel very comfortable to hold, but very prone to dropping. I think the harder, more angular edges that later models started to adopt was definitely the better play in terms of handheld peace of mind. Nevertheless, the build quality of the iPhone XS definitely screams quality and makes holding the phone without a case a a real joy and really pushes forward that minimalist aesthetic that was popular at the time. It is worth bearing in mind that obviously the iPhone XS predates the iPhone 12, which introduced ceramic shielding. So this phone is more prone to chips and scratches than much more recent models. But mum's done a great job in keeping this one in good condition. The mute switch on the side of the phone has been an iPhone mainstay since the very beginning. And having used phones that didn't have a mute switch, it's always very much appreciated to see one. Not that my phone ever leaves mute anyway. The 5.8 inch OLED display pumps up to 625 nits of peak brightness and produces incredibly sharp images and colours just pop on it. I don't know if it's just the colours that Apple chooses to use for its app icons or whatever, but I've used devices with far newer displays and this holds up incredibly well. Main drawback however is I've got 
gotten incredibly used to 120 hertz displays over the last few years, and iPhones didn't adopt ProMotion until the iPhone 13 series. So it does feel like a massive step back when trying to adjust to slower frame rates. If you've never used a higher refresh rate device, you won't notice or miss this. But if you have, it is quite jarring and makes the phone feel stuttery and sluggish when it's probably not. This isn't a fault of the iPhone XS in particular, but it is a smaller phone, at least in comparison to my OnePlus 8 Pro. Therefore, to me, it can feel a bit cramped in the hand. If you're not into bigger phones, then this could be right up your street. And the lightweight design in both hand and pocket is definitely a plus. The 10s launched with three different colours, ranging from space grey, silver, and the model my dear mum chose... gold. Whilst it's certainly not the colour I would have chosen, it is nice and sufficiently understated. I could really see the appeal of matching this up with a coordinated Apple Watch and paired jewellery. That whole rose gold aesthetic. On the back of the phone, we have two cameras, which today feels like below the bare minimum. But remember, the iPhone generation prior to this was the first iPhone generation to have more than just one camera. We have ourselves, as previously mentioned, a 12 megapixel f1.8 main sensor and a 12 megapixel f2.4 telephoto sensor, both of which, even by today's standards, still produce some pretty decent photos. No, they're not going to compete with any photos of phones released today, but shoot in the right conditions with a splash of colour and contrast, stick them onto social media where they're going to be compressed anyway, and nobody is really going to be the wiser. Where the cameras really do struggle, and it's by no surprise, is in low light, especially that telephoto. Something I do miss, though, is that pill-shaped camera design that was iconic of its time. Now we're seeing iPhones with cameras so big and so plentiful that they're starting to resemble a countertop stove. Something that I don't really understand about iPhone cameras, and this is definitely an iOS issue, is that the camera settings is not located in the camera app, but is located in the settings app. This seems like an unnecessary amount of hopping around the phone when I just simply want to change some camera settings, when really the quickest route would be within the camera app itself. I'm guessing it's just to streamline the experience for people who just want to point and shoot, but if I want to change between 30 frames per second and 60 frames per second, or 1080p and 4K on the fly, well then, fuck me I guess. No raw photo capability either, so big sad. One of the things that I thought would really irk me was the notch. It's so obnoxious that it's become synonymous with the iPhone design language now. You see that big old forehead and you immediately know it's an iPhone. But after literally an hour or so, I completely stopped noticing it for the most part. Sure, when watching videos you might still remember it's there, but it's not nearly as intrusive as I thought it was going to be. And it's obviously there to host Apple's Face ID. A feature that I found to work maybe 95% of the time. It's really effective, fast, and reliable, unless I'm wearing glasses, or a hat, or a hood, which can get really annoying. It's times like that when I'd really appreciate an alternative backup biometric, like a fingerprint sensor, be it built into the display or under the power button. Other phones at the time were doing just that. iPhones are still not doing that. I think the main thing that makes the iPhone XS still very much viable in 2023 is, well, iOS. The fact that in 2023, five years after this thing was launched, it's still getting consistent software updates is outstanding. Though, I don't know for how much longer that's going to continue. It's crazy how Androids typically get between three to four years of consistent software updates, but iPhones are generally supported for considerably longer. I mean, this particular iPhone XS is now running iOS 16, four iOS generations after iOS 12 when this was launched. What's great is that the A12 Bionic chip that's powering this device is more than capable of handling whatever iOS 16 wants to throw at it. That's a major benefit when a company designs both its software and the hardware that that software is going to operate on, creating a really nice synergy. This goes a step further. Yes, flashy animations and transitions are nice and all, but app stability is one of the main things that actually helps you enjoy a phone. But, and I hate to say it, I have experienced far less bugs and crashes on this iPhone XS than I do regularly on my OnePlus 8 Pro. And I can see why, for a lot of people, 
iOS really sticks the landing. So for most people, if you're moving to iOS for the first time or trying to pick up a phone maybe on a budget or buying for someone younger like a teenager, the iPhone 10s in 2023 really is a solid shout. But I left iOS and have been on Android now for many years. There were definitely some quirks about iOS that I wasn't too sure of and some that I was quite fond of. For starters, and I'm sure for those who watch regular tech videos will be very well aware of this, Android is the land of customization. Something that I sought after when making the original switch to the Galaxy S8 in the first place. The main thing that I really missed from Android when using iOS was being able to customize my app layout and icons. I've spent so many hours tweaking and changing positions of icons and layouts on Android to really tailor the experience to myself. Rearranging app icons on iOS is frustrating to say the least. With iOS's cascading tile movement and not being able to just place an icon into an empty space, I really dreaded having to organize my home screen and sorting newly installed apps into a layout. I know there are workarounds, but these feel really half-baked and require a lot of hoops to jump through. Whilst customization is limited, the overall aesthetic of the phone is very pleasing. The app drawer though, look, I'm glad that Apple is finally experimenting with a dedicated app drawer, but the way that this one organizes apps it's just not it. A simple app drawer that's organized maybe into alphabetical order would have been so much cleaner and simpler to navigate. Some minor nitpicks include the notification center and the control center being in completely different windows. I also keep going to look for the setting shortcut in the control panel only to be disappointed that it's not there. Overall, notifications and the control center is something that I just think Android pips iOS for. Android's organization and stacking of related notifications is far more concise and clean than that done by iOS. My biggest gripe with iOS so far, and I'm sure a lot of Android users will agree, is no dedicated back button. Why is it so hit or miss on an iPhone? Some apps support swiping from the left as a back gesture. Great, but a lot, too many, require you to hunt around the display for either a back symbol, back text, a little cross, and this could be in any corner of the screen. Not the most intuitive. If you've always been on iOS, you've probably never noticed this or even care. But once you've had a great feature like that, it becomes really easy to miss it. For an operating system and chipset that really boasts about multitasking capability and background usage, when it comes to the actual multitasking window itself, why can't I clear all apps from running at once? I remember opening up my parents' multitasking windows to see them having hundreds of open background apps and now I get it. They just can't be asked to keep removing them all one by one, by one, by one, by one. Damn, so far this list makes it sound like I actually really don't like iOS. When actually, I'm quite fond of it. For the most part, I have really enjoyed using it. Having access to features like iMessage and FaceTime again is really nice. Text messaging on Android, and look, I know I'm gonna piss off a lot of people, but it's just not as good. Being added into text messaging groups from people who are on iOS and seeing the messages separately and not seeing what's been responded to is really frustrating. Half the time, I haven't even clocked on that it's a group message in the first place. In the UK, at least, the majority of people are on iOS, so iPhone users really don't have that same struggle. However, in the UK, people also use other messaging services over iMessage, such as WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Instagram Messenger, so it isn't the be-all and end-all. One of the main reasons that people love iOS, however, is, well, the ecosystem. Being able to have all of your devices connected together symbiotically. I only have an old 2015 MacBook Pro, but I have been airdropping photos and files to that, and it's been a really pleasant upgrade. In fact, one of the main reasons that I'm debating switching back to iPhones is because because I'm thinking about upgrading my MacBook to a newer model so that I can edit videos and photos on the go and just from my sofa. But I'm not entirely sold on switching to other Apple products just yet. I prefer other audio alternatives to AirPods anyway. I really like my Samsung Galaxy Watch. And as I said in my most recent video, I'm not really sure what the deal with iPad is anyway. So being wrapped up in the whole ecosystem isn't really much of a selling feature for me. But like I said earlier, the iOS experience is really solid and reliable, and it's not put me off making the jump back. However, I think overall, I'm going to maybe wait for a few more features to arrive to iOS before I make the switch completely. And those are, for starters, USB-C across all Apple devices. No more of this lightning cable bullshit, please. I want one cable for 
everything. And easy to navigate app draw. Sounds simple. Better customization options. It doesn't have to be crazy, but please just make it easier. And arguably, most importantly, an under display fingerprint sensor. We can't always rely on Face ID. These things, alongside continuous improvements to already competent, capable, and damn right impressive hardware and software, these are all things that are going to make picking up an iPhone as potentially my next daily driver incredibly compelling. Anyway, I've been going on for a little while now, so you're probably getting sick of hearing my voice. So I'm going to go and uh, catch you in the next one. I regret to announce this is the end. I'm going now. I bid you all a very fond farewell. <laughs>